Hello, hello. 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 So the whole team is together now. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think Kiriakos, how, how do I pronounce your names? Hardo? Right? And Koya. Uh, Ardo? And Koya. And Koya. Koya. Oh, hi. <laughs> well, nice meeting you. Yeah, very nice, nice meeting you, you and so much. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's a great, great privilege and honor that you allocated an hour to us. And, my pleasure. Yeah. Well, um, a very brief introduction from my side, uh, from our side. Uh, I um, learned about your book as I wrote in the email from the right. English writer Paul Kingsnorth, who went to Mount Athos and wrote in his blog about about your book and uh, and. Uh, it was uh, at the end, of, uh, at the beginning of January, I dislocated my shoulder and was waiting for anesthesia in the wow. waiting room in a hospital. And uh, because I had eaten in the morning, I had to wait before they get to the anesthesia. And then I started to read your book in on the phone while waiting for the anesthesia. <laughs> And really, the, this book helped me through. For, I was, I mean, it's, it's also physical pain went away, but uh, all this kind of, you know, uh, it kind of yeah. this thing affects yeah. you mentally as well. And this uh, this book really helped me through a uh, pretty difficult time. Uh, I'm delighted. Yeah. <laughs> the, spirit what... work, the spirit works in mysterious ways. <laughs> it, it, it did indeed, yes. And... Uh, and well, let's start then. Uh, I, I've uh, listened to your YouTube, so I know in broad outlines your uh, how uh, your trajectory, but our readers won't. So please tell us. Uh, as I said, I know I know in broad outlines how the how the story goes. But uh, how did you? Well, first of all, you went you, you went to study uh, accounting and the business. I understand. Yes. Yes. And then. I I wanted to make a living. <laughs> then sociology and then Christian mystics. It's quite <laughs> then that's quite that's quite a journey. Uh, could you just yeah. <laughs> yes, I, had you told me these things when I was a teenager, I would tell you you must be out of your mind. <laughs> it was the equivalent of going to the moon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I can I can I can see your point. Yeah. So um you, you in in your lectures you told about sort of uh, strange coincidences that first uh, shifted your uh, and some of uh, some of the uh, some of those you elaborated but how first of all how was the switch from uh, accounting uh, and business to sociology well that was a time when i was experiencing a lot of um, distress um because I realized that somehow I was in the wrong field mm -hmm. and I was about to graduate in it. Uh, so I said to myself, uh, am I going to spend the rest of my life counting numbers and balancing balance sheets? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I was good at it too. It's just that um, the experience of America challenged me on a very deep level. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly the exposure to the liberal arts, the few liberal arts that I had to take as a, uh, as a, uh, a business student, mm -hmm. uh, those things were eye-opening for me. Um, philosophy, psychology, uh, as a social science in general, literature. And that was, a, I think, in retrospect, the power of the undergraduate education in America. Mm -hmm. You are not being uh, pigeonholed from high school in terms of what you are going to become. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's more open in, in, in that sense. So as I was going through that uh, period of adjustment, uh, coming from Cyprus, growing up in a very traditional society, and uh, reality was clearly defined by religion, by family, by uh, the schools. And I find myself in the challenging relativistic multicultural envi environment of America, uh, that raised questions about what what is the meaning of life? Where do I come from? Where am I going? So it was a period of, um, I would say, uh, what sociologists would call a state of alienation. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I, I think this is almost like uh, 
a necessary stage to grow out of your contentment within your cocoon of traditional uh, background. Right. And I accidentally, quote unquote, I met a, a sociology student and uh, we had lunch at the student union and I was asking what, what, what did his, what was he studying? And he said, well, I, I just came out of a course in sociological theory. I said, well, what is that? <laughs> and then he was excited to tell me about uh, the theory of functionalism. And he started putting on paper what he was uh, studying uh, that day. And I thought, my Lord, this is very fascinating. <laughs> Never heard of functionalism or conflict theory, etc. <laughs> So uh, then I realized that I have more in common with that uh, guy than my classmates in the business school. Mm -hmm. So after a lot of reflection, I went and saw the chair of the sociology department, uh, a, a very, a, a very uh, uh, lovely uh, woman uh, who took. Uh, seriously my concern about graduating in the wrong field. And he said, well, why don't you apply to graduate schools in sociology? I said, but I don't have any background in sociology. Well, do it anyway. So I started applying for a master's degree in various schools. Mm -hmm. And I, I was getting um, uh, acceptance, but no financial assistance. They would say, well, come here and then we'll see, because I had no background in sociology. Mm -hmm. um, and when after uh, a lot of rejections in reference to uh, financing, I went to see Mrs. Botti again and I said, well, uh, it seems that I will just go back to Cyprus with my degree in business and I'll make my life there. And I said, here I have this, uh, uh, these forms from Bowling Green State in Ohio, and I'm not going to fill them because I know what the answer will be. I just don't have the background to get an assistantship, for example. And she looked at me very severely and she said, go home and fill up those forms. You are missing your chances. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the beginning of my sociological career. In a month's time, I got a call from Bowling Green State offering me a full uh, assistantship. Oh. Mm. So these are the coincidences. Yeah. You know, had I not met that uh, sociology student, who knows whether I would have gone into sociology. And this has happened repeatedly in my life. And then I realized that it's everybody's life. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, change a, a simple detail, and then you would be in a different side of the universe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it is also true in uh, history. Mm -hmm. Many of the great events in history were the results of uh, extraordinary coincidences and synchronicities. Change one little detail and the history of the world would have been different. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, well, one bullet changed the history of, of the world. Uh, the killing of uh, Ferdinand. Yeah. Of <laughs> and then you had the... Uh, uh, the, uh, the First World War and the First World War creating the conditions of the, uh, the Russian Revolution and Lenin coming to the Finland station. <laughs> so the whole of history is like that, as it is in our lives. Yeah. It, it shows that, in fact, we um, nothing is accidental, but nothing is determined. Yeah. Yeah, it's this kind of archetypical causation. Uh, what's yes. This? Yeah, yeah. I noticed that you had uh, Richard Tarnas in your... Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 that's he's, exactly. <laughs> he's the best about these things. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was a, that was a fascinating uh, conversation, yes. Um, yeah. Very interesting coincidence. I just uh, well uh, the, the the story that you told in one of the in one of the speeches that uh, in sociology, when you were studying already sociology, and uh, and you had to make a presentation in one seminar, you had to make uh, choose a sociologist. Yes, and for, uh, sort of uh, first first come first serve basis. Please uh, tell that story, and then 
Uh, who was Sorokin? Uh, who, uh, and yeah. he, he, he played an important role in my life. In what sense? Um, I went to the, uh, the the first school that gave me an assistantship for a doctoral degree was at uh, the University of Kentucky, hmm. and I went there. Um, I didn't even know where Kentucky was. <laughs> I just. The, the first school that gave me the assistantship, I accepted it. And I went there and I was miserable. I, I just uh, didn't, uh, somehow I got adjusted to North America and, and the Yankee culture. And all of a sudden now I find myself um, with uh, strange, strange accents and the South and the former Confederacy. <laughs> so I, I, I was eager to, to get back to the north. And I was happy because a former professor of mine uh, found me uh, another uh, position at Wayne State in Detroit. And, but so when I look back, I said, Kentucky was extremely important in my own intellectual development. Why? Because I met Sorokin, mm -hmm. Peter M. Alexandrovich Sorokin. Not that I met him personally, but I, uh, I was taking this course in sociological theory and uh, the professor was on a first come first basis in terms of choosing a master of sociology to write on. And I was planning on choosing somebody like Marx, uh, Weber, uh, Durkheim, uh, the, the well-known classical writers in, this, uh, in the field of sociological theory. And, I, and those names were all taken and the only one that was left was Sorokin and Spencer, the English uh, sociologist. And I didn't like Spencer because of his uh, uh, laissez-faire theories and so on. So I never heard of Sorokin. And I said, oh my God, I'm going to waste my semester studying some obscure sociologist. Anyway, mm -hmm. Sorokin uh, introduced me into a way of thinking that was very, very different from everything else that I was being exposed to. Right. Uh, his background was, um, he was secretary to Kerensky during the Russian Revolution. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, he, um, he came from a, um, a, a village background in Northern uh, Russia. And uh, he didn't have a stable uh, life because his father was, uh, a, um, a specialist in fixing icons. So the family was moving from village to village. So Sorokin was self-taught. Uh, eventually he had to abandon his father because he was uh, alcoholic and abusive. So he and his brother went on their own as uh, young teenagers. Eventually, to make a long story short, he ended up uh, getting a doctoral degree in sociology uh, from uh, St. Petersburg uh, University. And during the revolution, uh, he took part in it before the Bolsheviks took over. And when the Bolsheviks took over, he went into the woods uh, to avoid uh, execution. Eventually surrendered to the communists, the Bolsheviks, who sentenced him to death. And he was expected to uh, be executed the following day. Uh, but a former student of his, who was a Bolshevik, pleaded with Lenin to uh, save Sorokin's life. And they, um, <laughs> apparently, from what a colleague of mine told me, Lenin said, who is that uh, obscure bourgeois ass? Get him out of jail, <laughs> just like that. So not only did he get out of uh, jail the next day instead of being executed, but he ended up uh, back at the university as professor of sociology. Oh. oh. But he continued his opposition to the Bolsheviks and uh, eventually he managed to leave uh, Russia, came to the United States, made a big name for himself as a very prolific sociological uh, thinker, uh, at the University of Minnesota, after spending there five years and uh, writing several seminal works, Harvard invited him and came to Cambridge to set up the sociology department there in the early 30s. 
So his way of thinking was based on all these experiences he had in Russia. And when I first came and started reading his biography, uh, I felt a certain affinity with him mm -hmm. because he was Eastern Orthodox. He was an immigrant. He was struggling to adjust to American society. Uh, and he was uh, a misfit in American, uh, in American culture at the time. So those things attracted me to him. But the most important was his way of thinking. He claimed that all of these um, theories about secularization and that the world is becoming more and more uh, secular and that God is dead and so on, all of that is a misreading of history. And he did a study of the historical um, evolution of Western civilization, something like Richard Turner's did, mm -hmm. but slightly from the sociological perspective. Mm -hmm. And he concluded that uh, the uh, Western civilization is moving into an age of uh, revival of religion and spirituality. Mm -hmm. So when everybody else was predicting that we are moving into an age of, of atheism, so to speak, he was talking about the coming uh, of uh, the revival of uh, spirituality and religion. Uh, and he wrote those things at, in the midst of the Second World War. Uh, so nobody took him seriously, nobody within his own uh, Ivy League environment. But also he claimed that um, our way of knowing the world is in three ways, through our senses, namely science, through our intellect, namely our, uh, through philosophy and mathematics, and through intuition, he said, as a, a methodology in and of itself. And in, in the West, he said, we have developed the, um, uh, the sensate way of knowledge, namely uh, empirical science, the philosophical meaning mathematics and um, logic and so on. But we have neglected the intuitive aspects of our nature. And he, um, one, uh, one of his, uh, when he was invited to be the, selected to be the president of the American Sociological Association. Finally, they recognized his genius. Uh, he talked about the need to develop what he called integralist knowledge or integral truth that will honor all three strands of knowledge. Those things were um, very, um, very interesting to me. And also his notion that we not only have a conscious and an unconscious, as Freud claimed, but also a supraconscious, as he claimed. Mm -hmm. And that people with certain intuitive abilities are ahead of us in terms of our evolution, evolutionary development. So Sorogin was, and I suspect, he developed these ideas because he must have been exposed to some of the great sages and saints of, uh, of Russian Orthodoxy, like uh, Saint Seraphim of Farov and, uh, and others. And he, he was sensitive to these kind of um, realities mm -hmm. because he didn't come from the West where the West was taken over by the um, rationalistic kind of movements. Mm -hmm. So that uh, impressed me enormously. And when later on in the late 70s, and early 60s, I met somebody that I called Daskalos or teacher who uh, exemplified some of those intuitive abilities, I said, my God, this is the empirical validation of what Sorokin was talking about. So you had a framework already, a theoretical yeah, framework. framework. And here I met accidentally mm -hmm. this um, philosopher healer in Cyprus, Daskalos, and I was so fascinated. I was planning on writing a book on international terrorism at the time. Uh -huh. So I gave up that project and I started uh, studying Daskalos, and I came with three books about him. So it was, uh, and then I real, I, I concluded that um, authentic spirituality is outside of organized religion. Until a friend of mine said to me, you must come with me to Mount Athos. Mm -hmm. And eventually I went with him to Mount Athos. I didn't expect to find anything there. <laughs> Just, uh, a lot of superstitious and ignorant monks. <laughs> and then I went, 
I met Father Maximus, who changed my life. Uh -huh. So Sorokin, Sorokin eventually led me to study uh, Hinduism and Buddhism and the other religious traditions and shamanism, all of that stuff. Uh, that was during, during the 60s where I got my graduate, my all of my higher education. That was a period of my secularization, a period of uh, overcoming my uh, my own cultural background and realizing that there is a vast multicultural world out there. And during the 70s, when I realized uh, that there is uh, a possibility of real knowledge, I was exposed to transcendental meditation. I came in contact with uh, the work of scientists like uh, Fritz of Capra, mm -hmm. Tao Physics. And I said, oh my God, I went to Emily one time and I said to her, I think we are going to discover God in the laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> So all of that created the background that when I met um, uh, Daskalos, I immediately placed him within the context of the intuitive uh, aspects of Sorokin. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then he, uh, he I, I, I discovered or I realized that there is a mystical form of Christianity that has been uh, ignored in the West. But I assume that only the, the, the authentic part of that mysticism is outside of the church. Mm -hmm. And when I visited Mount Athos in the 90s, that's, that's when I corrected my perception that, in fact, this mystical tradition has always existed within Christianity, but has been ignored because of historical reasons. Mm -hmm. And then I spent the next 20 years studying Father Maximus and His World, the book that you read. This is very briefly yeah. this trajectory uh, of the a series of extraordinary coincidences who led me to where I am right now, yeah. being in May of all places. <laughs> yeah. would, you, would you like to ask something? Or I, uh... I have a question from a very different area. <laughs> I'm a hobby painter, and I see on your back, uh, on the wall, on your back, I, I see the painting. Ah. And if you are talking about Mount Athos, I, I definitely have seen these rocks and everything and, and how it looked like. But somehow it's just my my uh, feeling or intuition is intuition going to this painting what is on your on, on your backside. But who is... Uh, the author of, of, of this nice painting? A nephew of mine. Ah! <laughs> yeah. It's very uh, nice. Uh, oh! Another one. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Also by nephew. Uh, and, and this is... Ah! This is uh, uh, an icon that was given to me by uh, uh, Ukrainians when I went to Canada to give a talk and look at the holy the holy virgin who holds the the maple of uh, of Canada. Uh huh. <laughs> so yeah, downstairs we have a lot of uh, uh, paintings from friends and. Uh, uh, also, icons from Mount Athos. Uh -huh. And is it uh, is it so that your your way you have described is uh, somehow leading to you to this to this uh, art to those paintings and whatever? Well, I don't think that is related to um, anything that I went through myself. But uh, it was uh, from uh, my nephew. Who, when he was, uh, he's an amateur uh, painter, and we got it from him. Right. So you're an artist. You're an artist. Yeah, I'm also amateur. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send you. We'll, we'll send you a couple of uh, copies of the pictures <laughs> for, the, for, for as a sign of gratitude. Yeah, my my daughter is an artist. She teaches art at uh, at the local high school here. Wow. 
she is into media. She's teaching media, new media. Uh-huh. And also she does painting. It's right. very interesting. Right. Uh, well, we are at the Mount Athos now, uh, which is the main focus would be of this um, conversation. Right. Uh, just for our readers, could you just briefly outline the history? Because that's uh, I read it from your book, but readers won't have. Just yeah. your, your kind of uh, condensed summary of this of this settlement there. Well, you know that um, Christianity went through different uh, uh, crises mm -hmm. and divisions. So in the until the 11th century, right? That's, uh, 1054 is the official breakup between the Eastern and the Western Church. Right. That was before the Protestant Reformation, before Luther. Yeah. And the reasons were historical and uh, also theological. Uh, it was a division because of the way Constantine divided the empire into the eastern part of the Roman Empire, what is known as Byzantium, and the western with Rome as the center of Western Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why Constantine did that is because he realized that Rome was not defensible and he needed a different kind of uh, place where he can build uh, his new capital. And that's when he created Constantinople, what is today Istanbul in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So uh, until the 1054, the two churches were uh, united, but there were problems along the way because of this separation, this administrative separation. Uh, so when uh, uh, Constantinople uh, was taken over by by the Turks, then uh, there was very little communication between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. So they followed a different kind of evolutionary development. And the Western Church had to face the onslaught of the Industrial Revolution, the, uh, the, 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 the Reformation, the um, uh, the, uh, the the conflict with science those things did not happen in the in the east and they didn't happen because uh, the the dominant uh, power in the east uh, was Islam yes. so Eastern Christianity turned inwards uh, in the monasteries uh, in their uh, uh, liturgies and so on so. Uh, there are a lot of similarities between Eastern Orthodoxy and Western uh, uh, Western uh, Catholicism, uh, but the basic uh, difference uh, is really the way one approaches the divine. How do I know God? The Western Church put greater emphasis on the intellect, on a philosophical kind of approach to God, study Aristotle, and uh, the, the great ancient philosophers. Uh, it's not accidental that Thomas Aquinas incorporated Aristotle into uh, Western theology, the scholastic tradition, whereas the Eastern Church um, followed a more experiential approach to the divine. How it's a, a more yogic tradition. It's not as if the West doesn't have those, but it is not so. Uh, predominant. Uh, the intellectual aspects have taken over, and the uh, uh, the way to God is through reason. So it is not accidental that in the Eastern, in the Western Church, uh, the plant, the, the, the seeds of the scientific revolution were planted in the monasteries, according to some historians, because of the scholastic focus on studying nature as a way of knowing God's work. And by studying God's work, you get to know the creator. Right. In the Eastern church, the focus was completely different. You, uh, you approach God experientially. And the monks of Mount Athos invented methods like um, 
the Jesus prayer that you uh, it's like a, a mantra yoga of, of sorts Jesus Christ Lord Savior have mercy on me and somehow once people engage in this um, in these practices something happens within themselves they begin to experience what they the monks call the uncreated light they begin to feel uh, the joy of being in in unison with uh, with the christ uh, again the west has the equivalent uh, saints who report about such experiences like saint john of the cross and and in protestantism my my uh, eckhart but in the in the Eastern Church is the dominant legacy, the dominant um, worldview, that the way to to know God is through direct experience of the divine light. And during the 13th century, the 14th century, there was a debate in the in the Eastern part of Christianity before the Turks took over between Saint Gregory Palamas the great uh, mystic from Mount Athos, and uh, Varlam, who was a Greek uh, monk from Calabria, Italy, who came to Byzantium, trying to convince the theologians there that the, the way to know God is through the methods of the scholastics, right. emphasis on high culture, on Plato, on Aristotle, and so on. Whereas uh, Gregor, and he was considering what the monks on Mount Athos were doing were superstitions. Mm -hmm. So Saint Gregory Balamas came from uh, from Mount Athos to Thessaloniki and to uh, 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 to Constantinople to debate Varlam about how to know God, and that went on for about four years. And at the end, there was a synod in the Eastern Church, which of the two. Uh, uh, represents the true theology of the Eastern Church. And they voted Gregory Balamas is the authentic uh, spokesperson of, uh, of um, Eastern Orthodox theology. And that was the theological split. I was talking to a um, to the, um, the Catholic Bishop of Portland in Maine and we were discussing this issue. And he said to me, look, Christianity has two lungs, hmm. one Western rational and the other Eastern uh, experiential. Both, both lungs are needed for proper breathing. I think that was a good way of putting it. Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was fascinated when I went to Mount Athos to discover um, a tradition that was very similar to what I was reading in Hinduism and Buddhism. That I said, my God, uh, Mount Athos is, is like the Tibet of Christianity. It's not as if the intellectual aspect is not there, but the greater emphasis is on purifying the heart because it is through the heart that you will know God. Whereas Varlam was talking about knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, it was closer to the classical Greek tradition, whereas, um, the, the Mount Athos tradition was uh, more like the prophets of uh, of Israel, the right. prophetic tradition. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a, perhaps one uh, one quote that I wrote up just before uh, just before we started to talk from your book, and um, and I think that relates to what you just said. I've asked you to comment on that. And, we lost the knowledge of God at this moment when we transformed the ecclesia, ecclesia from experience into theology, from a living reality into moralistic principles, good, good values and high ideals. I think it's Father Maximus who says right, that. Right, right. That's a very nice uh, summary of yeah. what we're talking about now. Yeah, I, I was very impressed with him because uh, he was the first person I met when I arrived on Mount Athos. He mm -hmm. was right there at the monastery of Vadobevi. And it was very interesting because I looked at the um, at some of the icons that they had uh, as you enter the monastery. Uh, the monastery was created in the uh, 1000, I believe. But then on one side, they had the, uh, the, the image of Aristotle, and on the other, that of Plato. Mm. 
with halos in both of their that, that they consider them that uh, I, I thought that was quite interesting. And uh, I remember I remember when I had um, I was waiting a friend of mine to go to Mount Athos. And I was in in Thessaloniki uh, spending a couple of days there waiting for him so that we can go together. And uh, I had tea uh, at a uh, at a restaurant next to the statue of Aristotle because Aristotle came from that part of the of the world. And then I said to myself, "Oh my God, I am now having tea under the shadow of Aristotle, and only uh, three blocks away is the burial ground and the church of Saint Gregory Palamas." In other words, the two philosophical traditions, uh, Aristotle via the scholastics and St. Gregory Balamas, which was more the experiential and more platonic in that sense. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, uh, well, uh, as, I, as I wrote to you, I've had quite a few interviews and the other activities uh, I've been lucky to be engaged in like, like last four or five years when I've started to read it from this from the scratch to start about these things in in, in the first place because I, I was trained to be economist and I was economist <laughs> and I've drawn like 600 kilometers of meaningless graphs I, I'm sure we can spend a lot of time talking about your journey <laughs> <laughs> no but that but that's not um, but what it has made me realize is the importance of the reformation in all uh, I mean of course, the, the the main question is what is going on right now in our society. That's what has been the question from from which the from which the quest has really started. But could you, having seen Mount Mount Athos and having thought about these things, what's your reading of the Reformation in the Western history now? Uh, uh, they ask me sometimes questions. What is the difference between Eastern Orthodoxy, um, Catholicism, and Protestantism? And uh, I, um, I tell them that I prefer to focus on what is positive, on what they have contributed in the development or the evolution of Western culture and civilization. Right. Uh, I, um, I, I claim that if there are things, uh, two things are important in terms of, the, of Catholicism. They preserve Western civilization at the time when uh, Rome was taken over by the uh, the northern tribes, mm -hmm. and it was Cath the Catholic Church that kept the uh, that kept Europe together, so to speak, and the Pope was almost like a, an emperor. That gave a kind of cohesiveness to West to a, a period of crisis in Western civilization. At the same time, the Western Church not only saved Western Europe, but also planted the seeds of the scientific revolution in the monasteries of the West through the scholastics and uh, the great intellectual tradition that came from. Uh, I, I remember I had a, uh, a philosophy course in my undergraduate career by um, uh, a philosopher who was a Catholic priest, mm -hmm. and he was a um, uh, giving us the, the scholastic uh, kind of philosophical tradition, Aristotle, St. Thomas Aquinas, and so on. So uh, I saw that firsthand in, in, in many respects. Protestantism gave us modern democracy, I think, mm -hmm. because of its emphasis on individualism, uh, the emphasis on um, the importance of the individual, um, it was, after all, Protestant um, reformers who worked to abolish slavery in, in the Americas and in, in England. So uh, I think that is the major contribution of Protestantism to modern civilization, to modern culture, um, democracy. Mm -hmm. I don't think Catholicism or even Eastern Orthodoxy uh, were fertile grounds for the development of democracy which is founded on individualism mm, right. right I mean there are problems of course uh, 
And then what is the contribution of the Eastern Orthodox tradition? I think the contribution is preserving the pathways towards the experiential approach to the divine. In other words, it is the yogic tradition of Christianity uh, that we Westerners uh, had to go to Tibet and to India to find out uh, about uh, an alternative to rationalism. So Eastern Christianity can make this contribution, I believe, through re revitalizing those methods on how to know God through the heart. Mm -hmm. So it's the Bhakti Yoga of Christianity, mm -hmm. whereas the Western part of Christianity is the Jnani Yoga. Uh -huh. Very interesting. Could you please uh, um, uh, elaborate on these two, two types of yogas? I'm, not, I, I'm on a British yeah. ground here. Um, you know, many, many poets um, and many uh, uh, philosophers who were more or less uh, disenchanted with the disenchantment of the West. Uh, they, they were searching for something uh, deeper. Uh, this is what led to the Romantic movement after all. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so many of them would go to, um, to India to find uh, uh, answers to these existential questions. Uh, because we in the West have assumed that the big questions of life can never be answered. I mean, that was my conclusion during the 60s, mm -hmm. that somehow there is no way of having knowledge of things that are beyond our capacity to know. And we assumed that our capacity to know was based on the scientific method mm -hmm. with the senses behind it. So uh, the, uh, uh, many, uh, many people who felt this need to a, a deeper kind of uh, experience, uh, they search in, uh, in India. And this is what made Maharishi Yogis coming to America so important because he brought that tradition on a more popular uh, level during the late 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the first encounter between East and West was in, the, in Chicago in, in 1893, the first parliament of religions. And that's when Vivigananda came to America and presented uh, the... Uh, presented to Westerners the wisdom of the East. And in fact, he welcomed the, uh, the, the field uh, auditorium there with uh, a welcome uh, statement. He said, uh, brothers and sisters of America. And then the audience went ballistic mm -hmm. with this kind of introduction. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of being, of coming in contact with the presence of these other civilizations, um, Hinduism and Buddhism. And I don't know if you have um, met or um, read the work of Houston Smith. I've the heard work, the name, uh, but I haven't read this. Yes. You, you would recommend the, it? The Worst Religions, I think it's a classic. It's the best ever written uh -huh. about the, um, what is the, what he calls the distilled wisdom of the human race. Mm -hmm. And that is another book that influenced me in terms of my understanding of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Eastern religions. In fact, Houston Smith came to our house and he stayed with us uh, uh, for two or three nights. We invited him to the university. Uh, we had an organization uh, and we invited speakers like him. So he stayed in our house and uh, I told him that uh, his book is really an incredible uh, help to a lot of people and that I used it in one of my courses. And I said to him, but you know, Professor uh, Smith, uh, when you revise your uh, book, um, The World's Religions, I think you may want to do a more, uh, a more developed presentation of uh, discussion of, the, of Eastern Orthodoxy. Because I, I found that part of his book not as developed. 
even though I was not really uh, studying, that was before I met Father Maximus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I, I said that to him before he was about to leave for the airport. And then he said to me, why don't you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I don't think so. I don't think I have any plan to do that. <laughs> but it was pre uh, he felt it somehow that I was going to uh, do this kind of work. No, yes. Um, uh, the um, where were we? Uh, we were talking about uh, uh, a Reform uh, reformation guy, guy as a watershed in in. There are people who claim that uh, if uh, if Luther had access to Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, he probably would have joined ranks with the Eastern uh, uh, with the Eastern part of Christianity. But at that time, the Eastern part was cut off by the Muslim uh, world, uh, by Ot the Ottoman Turks. So there was not that much communication between the two. Mm -hmm. And speaking about that, we, we live at an extraordinary time because we, uh, we can get the wisdom of planet Earth in paperback. Yes. Something like in the past, we had to cross mountains and the desert to yeah. now we travel, we meet people. We don't have to, we don't have to, um, to have seminars about Buddhism when we have a neighbor next door being a Buddhist. <laughs> it never happened before in the history of, particularly the United States is fertile ground for this kind of, uh, of mixing. So it's really the globalization. In, uh, globalization with... Yeah. So uh, th there are a lot of bad things about globalization, but there are also some good things. Yeah. And one of that is, um, I, I think it has a deeper spiritual meaning mm -hmm. to, yeah. so that we get to understand one another right. and, uh, and think that we are part of the same spiritual uh, uh, inheritance. Right. Yeah, I, I have a question. Initially, you said that that uh, you thought that uh, mystic, uh, mysticism is out of uh, church and when you went to Mount Tautos you found out that no that this mystical Christianity is, is in the uh, church what well, yeah, go ahead. Is, yeah is this mysticism in in every confession or well uh, no I I had my prejudices against organized religion mm. and um, one of the sources of that prejudice is the role of the church the political role of the church in the greek world specifically in cyprus mm -hmm. uh, yeah. because the archbishop uh, was behind uh, the nationalist movement there which brought a lot of violence and this disaster to the island. So I had that kind of uh, negative uh, baggage coming mm -hmm. from, from that. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course, being uh, trained as a sociologist, I had another baggage against organized religion coming from the social sciences, mm -hmm. uh, that it is, uh, uh, it does not encourage an open mind. It, uh, it is uh, um, a bunch of uh, superstitions and mythologies. And uh, therefore, um, it, it is not to be taken seriously other than going to the church for cultural reasons. Mm -hmm. For example, when I went to the United States, the church was a place, the Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, was a place where it would give me some breathing space to adjust to American society. Later on, I discovered as a sociologist that the, one of the reasons why religion survived in America, and it's more religious than Europe, for example, is that the different denominations played an important role in the assimilation of immigrants. Mm -hmm. It gave them a sense of belonging while they came here bewildered by the new world they found themselves in. So for me, going to the church, I met other Greeks. I, I heard the chants that I grew up with, uh, but I wasn't taking the religion intellectually very seriously. It was for me at the time, a kind of a cultural uh, um, 
uh, cushion mm -hmm. to give me time to get to know America. Mm -hmm. Well, when I went to Mount Athos, I realized that there is another side of the Eastern Orthodox religion, uh, which is this kind of mystical um, uh, spirituality that is so uh, uh, so sought after by inte uh, uh, renegade intellectuals of the West. They go to Hinduism and Buddhism. I said, this is in my cultural backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and this is, and it was easy for me because I, I always enjoyed being in church, listening to the chants. I just didn't like the political role of the church in Greek society. Mm -hmm. uh, but on Mount Athos, I, I realized that, that there is this other side that it's not very well known. And this is why one of the reasons why I spent my time giving up everything else and then studying Father Maximum and, and, and his world. And I wrote uh, a trilogy about my encounters with Father Maximus. Mm -hmm. uh, saying these things, some people assume that because somebody is a saint or a great sage, uh, that they are all knowing, that somehow they are uh, the embodiment of, the, they, they can even uh, uh, be the leaders of a country. No, uh, it, it's a different form of knowledge. And uh, nobody is uh, flawless. We are all human beings, and we are, we all make mistakes, and we are all all knowing. So somebody may be very knowledgeable and very spiritual and very saintly, but it doesn't necessarily mean that is somebody who can have a conversation about Eastern Orthodoxy and Buddhism or Hinduism. Mm -hmm. They won't know. Uh, there will be a lot of misunderstanding and superstition about that. Uh, so I, I, I had a um, an email the other day of uh, someone who told me, oh, such a, such a saint um, who is considered to be a saint today said this and that, which is uh, how could a saint uh, say something like that that is com completely wrong? And then I had to write to, her, to write to her that just because somebody is a saint, it doesn't mean that they are all knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are, uh, they don't have the, uh, the infallibility of a Pope. <laughs> 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 so they make mistakes and they're human beings. They are part of culture. And Eastern, if somebody uh, as, uh, assumes that in Eastern Orthodoxy or in any uh, spiritual tradition, everybody will be a, ki a kind of a, an elder or a master, they will be disappointed. <laughs> because they, they will find uh, ordinary people who are not perhaps not very educated perhaps they they have a lot of uh, prejudices and they can bring them out um i think this is the same thing about uh, the bible mm -hmm. even the sacred text that's one problem i think fundamentalist protestantism has uh, take everything literally Something, in fact, that the great saints of uh, the great uh, patriarchs of Christianity uh, were not taking everything literally. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I mean, as Father Maximus would say, the Bible is not a geology book. You know? <laughs> it's not a geology book. It's a book on how to uh, to live uh, spiritually. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh I just came from a a talk that uh, I gave with my wife. She's not here uh, in um, in the Midwest, and uh, I met a uh, a lawyer who was um, who was trying to become a um, a rabbi, and uh, he came from a rabbinical kind of a background, and he never read. Uh, he, he was very very uh, militant against uh, any uh, contamination of, uh, of his understanding of Judaism. And then he decided to, to study the New Testament and to uh, show that it is full of inaccuracies. 
What do you think happened to him? This is a, I've never heard anything like this. The gospel converted him hmm. just by studying it. He said, but this is exactly what the rabbis have been saying throughout the ages. And uh, nobody told me that, in fact, this is the case. He had to study himself. I thought that was interesting. Mm, yeah. Uh, uh, there's an interesting phrase that you dropped in one of your lectures that was it like 1970s when you started to overcome your own or be, be, become skeptical about your own skepticism? Could you please, right. could you please uh, elaborate on that theme a little bit? Well, by the time I got my doctoral degree in sociology, and that was a long time ago, in 1970, mm -hmm. uh, I was an agnostic. I thought that the big questions of life cannot be answered. Uh, <clears throat> after I left Kentucky and went to uh, Wayne State, most of my professors were secularists. Somehow, uh, the background from Sorokin was it became part of my uh, subconscious, mm -hmm. and uh, the environment was extremely secular at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I was a, a skeptic, a reluctant skeptic. I, I I was never enthusiastic about my skepticism or my agnosticism, because I thought if you wanted to be a modern intellectual, you cannot have beliefs in this mythological kind of uh, uh, religious uh, doctrines. Uh, and then when I started um, doing the uh, uh, one day I I walked uh, in in my office and my next door uh, colleague uh, Stephen Marks we got our jobs at the university the same year and that was during the first week of classes. And I saw a sign outside of his door, which says meditation in process. And I, I, I got very, very curious about it. And then he introduced me to transcendental meditation. And I, he convinced me that it was good for me because <laughs> I, I can work harder because I, I will have so much more energy through meditation. And then he showed me all kinds of literature about the, the biological effects of meditation. And also there is the possibility of attaining cosmic consciousness through deep meditation. Well, I became a meditator in no time. So for <laughs> seven years, I was doing the, both me and my wife were doing the transcendental meditation practice, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night. I never attained cosmic consciousness, but I saw the benefits of deep meditation. It was very, very life enhancing. So when I met Daskalos, I had to shift my meditation to a different methods. And after I met uh, uh, Father Maximus, I had to, to go back to the methods that the, the monks were using on Mount Athos. I mean, three different meditation practices. Mm. Uh, but I, I started reading also anthropological literature about shamans. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember the Don Juan uh, books yeah, yeah. of Carlos Castaneda. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they were controversial, yeah. but as literature, and as uh, they had heuristic value for me. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they introduced me into the possibility of, uh, uh, of uh, entering into alternate realities. Mm -hmm. right? And, um, and, and this, that was part of my preparation for meeting Daskalos, actually, which I met accidentally. Uh, and once, once I met him and I decided to switch my focus and studying him rather than terrorists, because I thought he was, mystics were more interested than terrorists. <laughs> uh, I, uh, after I came back with my, uh, my material, I went to see um, Michael Harner at the New School of Social Research. Ah. You know Michael Harner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just read his book, the, the Way of the Shaman. The Way of the Shaman, yes. So I thought here is somebody who will understand what I encountered in Cyprus. And I went there to the New School of Social Research. And as I was walking up the steps to, to meet uh, Michael Harner, I, 
I, I bumped into an old friend. She was a uh, professor of political science at the new school. And he said, oh, what are you doing here? I said, I'm going to see Michael Harnett. Why do you want to see him? I said, why, as you are, why are you asking me that question? <laughs> and he said, well, I don't know. He's uh, kind of weird. <laughs> well, I met him and he was not weird at all. It's just that uh, Michael Harner went to study the Jivaros in the Amazon and they told him, uh, if you want to understand us, you have to become one of us. Yeah. Are you willing? And then he, he said yes. And they gave him some very powerful hallucinogenic uh, mushrooms that really turned his mind around. He almost died. And if it wasn't for the, for the shamans, the Jivaros, uh, he would have died if, had he done it on his own. Anyway, so he came back to the States as a bona fide Jivaro uh, shaman. And he opened up the uh, Center for Shamanic Studies in Connecticut. We, we had a, uh, he had a, a phone call during our conversation. He was very supportive in terms of what I was doing. And he, he gave me a, a kind of anthropological blessing about the work that I was doing with Lascaros. It was legitimate anthropology, social anthropology. So somebody called him on the phone and wanted to debate him on public television about uh, his work. Mm -hmm. And he said, to, he said to him, you know, if you want me to debate you, I will put a precondition. You have to come in one of my workshops and then bring along a drum. <laughs> <laughs> How did this go? Yeah, I don't know whether he took up his uh, invitation. <laughs> he invited me, in fact, to go to his uh, uh, shamanic uh, uh, ecstasy practices. But I was uh, reluctant because I didn't want to mix in one tradition with another. Uh, I, I, I came back from a different tradition and I prefer to stay within that cultural milieu in terms of any possible ecstatic experiences. Yeah. I just say, yes, I saw also a documentary about him uh, where the, the hand. Yes. Well, he, he was a very wonderful human being and uh, with a developed sense of humor. Yeah. I understood it from the, from the film as well. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think the the hour has went like uh, like that as it is in good conversations. Uh, yeah, just, well, go ahead. I was going to say that uh, th there are uh, Eastern Christianity. I believe is characterized by three things, among others. Uh, one is that it is a healing tradition, mm -hmm. meaning that the ultimate aim of the spiritual practice is to heal the right. deepest part of ourselves to unite with God. The second is, uh, it is a desert tradition in the sense that to get there, you have to go through the desert of cleansing yourself from all the accumulated, uh, and it is a miracle tradition. Uh, things happen uh, in, um, in uh, among people who are engaging into these spiritual practices. I hear stories, I have I had not witnessed myself directly, but I've heard stories of uh, levitation, of uh, being in two places at the same time. These things I assume existed only in Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, with the study of uh, the rishis of India, uh, the, I don't know if you've read Yogananda's autobiography of a yogi, no, I haven't. Yeah, that is full of stories of this kind of miracles. I mean, I, I had a, um, a couple of professors who came to see me one time uh, to reveal some of the experiences they had when they visited uh, some ashrams in India and met with some of the uh, with crazy stuff <laughs> of by location and so on. Uh, so I, I found the same things uh, among the practitioners of the Eastern Orthodox, uh, um, of Mount Athos. Uh, Elder Baisios, for example, who is now a saint. Uh, Elder Porphyrios, these are 20th century saints. They, they are miracle workers. Uh, 
they can tell about you everything that goes on in your life before you even say anything about it they, as if they are reading your uh, yourself so uh, it is this that also added to my attraction to eastern orthodoxy that uh, it's a living tradition it is a miracle tradition and it has a method on how to clean yourself from egotistical desires um, uh, in, in my experience with Daskalos, the, th the three previous, the, the decade before, I witnessed unusual phenomena that I could not explain rationally, like healing a woman that had problems with her spine mm. in a matter of 45 minutes. The x ray shows, the x rays that she took a week earlier showed a very problematic spine. The doctors told her that she has to be in bed all her life. And the new x-ray showed a very normal spine. And it was a matter of just passing his hands over her back, uh, up and down for about uh, 45 minutes. And then she was out of bed, ready to go and make coffee for us in the kitchen. I, uh, I gave him the picture of a woman who had problems in New York City. He closed his eyes, he rubbed them, and he said the problems of this woman are in her teeth. The doctors couldn't find what the problems were. And uh, when I wrote the letter, this is what uh, Daskalos is saying. Uh, they couldn't believe it. They thought it was nonsense. nonsense. So they threw the letter away <laughs> in the wastebasket. So when I came back to the States, they called me up and they said, do you remember that case? I said, yes, I remember it. And he said, well, when we got your letter, we threw the letter away because we thought it was nonsense. I said, well, I don't blame you. How could he know 7,000 miles away what your problem was? I said, you don't understand. Um, the front teeth of my wife exploded and infect infectious pus, pus was dripping from the holes. Daskalo said that all her teeth are infected with uh, uh, and, and she should go to a dentist and take care of them and that's exactly what happened he told us things about our house here without ever visiting our house anyway so uh when i went to mount dathos i went there with this kind of bag of, of background with uh, encountering daskalos and seeing that there are such things as miracles quote unquote daskalos would say they, they were not miracles we just don't have a real understanding of how the universe works. Uh, it's the very last question that I think, I, which I think would fit here. So one quote from your book, where you, where, where you speak that I have learned to maintain a phenomenological attitude and approach to in confronting the miraculous. How in, could you just elaborate your phenomenological approach? Yes, in the miraculous. I think that seems to. Uh, I was very fortunate that phenomenology and ethno, ethno methodology these are terms used within the academic setting, that uh, when you are confronted with a reality that is so different from yours, don't try to explain it or explain it away. Try to understand it from within the context of, the, of your subjects. In other words, I did not go and tell um, Daskalos, how did you do? Uh, um, explain away what he did. Oh, this is just a slate of hand or whatever it is. Or go in with my categories of sociological understanding to explain it. I would sit down and say, now explain to me what you have done with that woman. What, uh, what, is the, uh, what kind of world do you live in? Mm -hmm. And then he was willing, because I did tell him, I am not going to debunk you. I'm, I'm not here to discredit you or to validate your, uh, your worldview. I just want to understand it from your own point of view. And then that was the under that's why I, I gave uh, pseudonyms to the two people that I studied. Right. So uh, phenomenology means that you go into the field and you try to understand your subjects from within their own categories of understanding. So that's also how I managed to pass my work as legitimate academic work. I, I was not trying to convince anybody that this is how things are. You make up your own mind. 
this is what these people say, how things are. I can only tell you about my own experiences. And I will discuss my own experiences with Daskalos in terms of the healings that I witnessed. But in terms of explaining them, I will ask him to explain to me what he was doing. Thanks. Um, I have a great books course here that I uh, then season now, and next season I'm planning Aldous Huxley's uh, Perennial Philosophy. Just a few, a few remarks that on, on that book, if it would be just that's uh, Aldous Huxley's Perennial Philosophy. Aldous Huxley. Yeah. Oh yes. In fact, I quote him in um, in my last book, The Accidental Immigrant. I call it a quest for spirit in a skeptical age. Uh, this came out about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, Huxley uh, claimed in, in his book that uh, a non-mystical life is a crazy life. We will go crazy if we eradicate the mystical from our lives. Mm -hmm. And he had experiences. He had experiences with... Um, uh, psychedelics because until the mid middle of the 60s experimenting with psychotropic uh, drugs were not illegal mm -hmm. and that I, I know people who became spiritual after experimenting with LSD I, I never did myself uh, and it is a very dangerous kind of approach to the spiritual actually but it, it had uh, an impact in the lives of people like Huxley, uh, who wrote the, um, on the doors of perception, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's based on her, uh, on, on 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 his own um, on his own experiences. And uh, Houston Smith was a friend of Huxley, yeah. and they together experimented with that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it became it became illegal because of what happened at Harvard with Timothy Leary. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he, uh, he created a scandal and then a law was passed to turn it illegal. So uh, uh, until that time, there were legitimate academics who were uh, experimenting with, the, uh, with this kind of uh, psychotropic drugs that is practiced by tribal societies. Mm -hmm. like the um, uh, Indians of the Southwest with peyote and uh, ayahuasca in uh, Latin America. Uh, so, yeah, I, I haven't read the book, uh, uh, the whole book, but I've, I've read about it. And uh, Huxley is a turning point in this development of rediscovering the mystical in Western civilization. Well, thank you so much for this uh, hour. I will really enjoy it. Uh, just, it's my pleasure. We can talk for hours, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, what language do you speak in um, Estonia, right? Estonia, yeah. Estonia. It's very close to Finnish. Very close to Finnish. Okay. All right. And you are, um, you are close to the ongoing war there. Unfortunately so. Yeah. yeah my Lord. Who knows? Uh, time horizons have shortened here, I think. What? what? Time, time horizons have shortened here, I think, because of this. Yeah. Uh, that's the... That's the we, take yeah. every, we take every newspaper as, you know, one at a time now. One at a time. Let's hope that it will not uh, go on forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, anything for closing for, 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 for you? Yeah, when we when we can wait uh, for the next book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I just published one. Uh, right now I am in. Uh... Very impatient. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no plans uh, right now for for next one. Yeah. Well, if the plans come, uh, coincidences will let me there. <laughs> right. I, I've I've published this. Uh, this series of books and uh, they in spite of what i say about phenomenology you cannot do this kind of work without affecting you oh, of course uh -huh. yeah. so, um, they have opened my mind to all kinds of possible realities and uh, 
I have come to the conclusion that modern science is a form of mystical spirituality in disguise. Exactly. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. We, no, that's we're on the same page here. Yeah. yeah. And uh, no, I think I, 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 it's such a del delightful to meet people who have come to these conclusions. Uh, it's the new paradigm that we are heading towards. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the, exactly. And the, uh, our first uh, newspaper was, uh, that's our 30th uh, now where your interview will be. Our first was about the paradigm change. So that's the, very much the business that we are, that we have. Yeah. So, as uh, a French philosopher said, the 21st century, either it will be spiritual or it will not be. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I heard it. You said it in your earlier lectures as well. Yeah. Let's hope, let's hope that uh, this war that is going on there in your neighborhood and it is affecting the whole world, uh, hopefully it will end and hopefully may have some positive repercussions. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the best. We have to have hope. Yeah. Yeah, because you think about it, uh, Europe today is the product of the Second World War. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, with all the disasters and the tragedies and so on, uh, I I would want to hope that we have, it was a, ter a terrific lesson for humanity to grow spiritually. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was one sentence that helped me uh, in that in these circumstances where I which I described at the beginning that you should take each blow as a opportunity for spiritual growth. Yes, that really yeah. was very uh, helpful. Father Maximus would keep reminding us of these yeah. things. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so well, it's it's been a pleasure, and uh, yeah. all the best to your efforts to. Yeah.